Good afternoon and welcome everybody. I'd like to call the November 12th Williamsburg City Council meeting to order. Rico? Mr. Rogers? Here. Ms. Ramsey? Here. Mayor Pons? Here. Vice Mayor Dent? Here. Mr. Maslin? Here. We have uh, three sets of minutes. We're going to do these separately. We'll do the first two if we could and then do the third. Yes. So I make a motion that we approve the minutes of June 8th, 2020 and June 11th um, business meeting. Second. Second. Mr. Rogers. Abstain. Ms. Ramsey. Aye. Mayor Pons. Aye. Vice Mayor Dent. Abstain. Mr. Maslin. Aye. And so then I would like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the July 1st, 2020 City Council organizational meeting. Second. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Ms. Ramsey. Aye. Mayor Pons. Aye. Vice Mayor Dent. Aye. Mr. Maslin. Aye. Thank you. So that takes us to public hearings. Uh, first, we have PCR number 20-017, request to the Williamsburg Parks and Recreational Department for a special use permit to add a fourth field to Kiwanis Park at 125 and 127 Long Hill Road. Ms. Burke, welcome. Good afternoon. This is an application by the Williamsburg Parks and Recreation Department. Well, this is not my slideshow either. Uh -oh, okay. <laughs> um, to add the fourth field at Kiwanis Park, the field would include an associated fencing, dugouts, scoreboard, lights, and press box, and bleachers. This property is designated as Parks, Parkway, and Recreation in the 2013 Comprehensive Plan, which includes parkland and open space to provide a generous amount of active and passive recreational opportunities. Lands to the north and east are designated low density single family detached residential and corridor commercial with lands to the south designated as public and semi-public and William and Mary land use. Lands to the west are located in James City County and are designated federal, state, and county land. This property is zoned single family dwelling district RS2. The property to the north and east are zoned uh, PUD and land, uh, as Long Hill Woods and RS2 with lands to the south zone William and Mary. Properties to the west in James City County are zoned public lands. The RS2 district allows with a special use permit lighted athletic fields owned or operated by the city of Williamsburg. This property is outside of the architectural review district and required no review. At a site plan review committee on August 19th, the committee inquired about parking to support this facility. The applicant indicated they work actively with Williamsburg James City County Schools to share parking at the adjacent school and the committee recommended approval. The applicant is proposing the fourth field, including the fencing, dugouts, scoreboard, lights, press box, and bleachers. Storm water will be handled through a swale on the outside of the new fence. Parks and Recreation staff, their engineer, and the city engineer met with some of the homeowners in the adjacent subdivision of Long Hill Woods prior to the Planning Commission meeting. The, land, the homeowners in attendance at the meeting expressed concern about the clearing of trees and stormwater. Planning Commission held a public hearing on September 16th, 2020, and two citizens spoke on the request. The Planning Commission voted to recommend approval of the special use permit to construct a fourth softball field and associated with facilities at Kiwanis Park. Following the Planning Commission public hearing, Parks and Recreation staff met with the neighbors to address tree clearing and stormwater concerns. As a result of this meeting and subsequent conversations, limits of disturbance have been pulled back. I'm gonna go through these slides. They're a little incongruous with what I'm speaking about right now, just to kind of bring council up to speed. This was the site plan that was presented to the Planning Commission. And this is the subsequent site plan that's been amended following Planning Commission to limit the amount of disturbance adjacent to the neighboring properties. Again, this is an aerial photograph of the existing conditions on the site. And this was the original proposed limits of disturbance. You can see it goes all the way out to the creek that's kind of opposite the uh, existing utility easement. And with the subsequent conversations that we've had, we've um, amended those limits of disturbance to the area that's highlighted in green in this illustration. That keeps all of the clearing on this side of the utility easement that runs adjacent to the ball fields. So in addition to all of those, there is an, an additional note that's been added to the site plan stating the contractor is to place tree protection and silt fence along the existing tree line to ensure no trees are removed beyond the eastern side of the utility clearing. 
To address storm concerns about stormwater, the engineer provided pre and post development drainage areas, and those can be seen on these two slides. This is the pre development drainage area. And then in the post development drainage area, you can see that there's a significant reduction in the amount of runoff that runs towards the uh, adjacent properties. In a final meeting with the neighboring property owners, there was a discussion regarding supplemental plannings. Uh, the Parks and Recreation Department spoke, Landscaping Department has indicated, and Landscaping Department has indicated there's room outside of the utility easement for three to four Nellie Stevens Hollies to provide an evergreen visual barrier from the property most closely loca located to the ball field. Their exact location will be determined following the uh, installation of the field just to ensure that they're outside of the, the slope area adjacent to the, to, the, um, to the drainage ditch. I'm available uh, if, the board, or if the council has any questions and Tyler Cobb from Parks and Recreation and the representative from AES is also present for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Burke. Madam Vice Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Burke, for the presentation. Um, very detailed. Um, one of the things I wanted to comment on was that I really appreciate how uh, the community spoke up and uh, you worked with the community to address their needs about um, the, the removal of trees and, and especially the stormwater concerns. So I think that's the way it's supposed to work. So um, th that was really appreciate the input from the community and you working with them. The, I did have a question and this may be for Tyler is, is uh, can you talk a little bit about the advantages of what that fourth field brings Well, good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of the City Council. So uh, adding that fourth field will allow us to add, uh, obviously, additional participants, teams, and family members to the area that would other otherwise go to other localities. So not only are we able to host more teams at the property, but that also brings about revenue to the city as far as uh, lodging, hotels, um, restaurants, all those things and additional amenities that come with an individual tournament. So it's more than just putting more people at Kiwanis Park during the tournament. Because in your typical tournament, you are, you're using fields in, in maybe in all three localities uh, in the area to, to accommodate the number of teams for that tournament. Correct, yes. So we typically, uh, tournaments, um, not only the historic triangle, but they also, um, have fields at, at Stony Run Park and Newport News. And so having more fields here um, is more desirable just because most of the teams stay in the historic area anyways. And so they would rather be able to play in Williamsburg. Um, and so having that fourth field would accommodate, uh, depending on the tournament format, but could be as many as 12 teams um, per day at that field. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, a couple questions uh, and comments. Uh, so. At our public hearing in, on, in September, I think the mayor started off saying that that was the best uh, planning department uh, staff report that he'd ever seen. So I'd like to say this is the best <laughs> planning department staff report I've ever seen. I think, it, I think it's great. And I think this project is a, good, a great example of how collaboration <clears throat> with all the stakeholders can produce a win-win outcome. And I'd like to personally thank uh, Parks and Recreation, the Planning Department, the City Engineer, uh, City Manager, uh, and our uh, civil engineering firm, AES, uh, for listening to the neighbors and reworking the engineering drawings to retain, as, as we discussed, retain more buffer area and uh, improve the drainage plan. Uh, Tyler, can you just expand upon what you uh, were talking about with the Vice Mayor? A lot of people, you know, drive around Williamsburg and they see all these ball fields. But if you could just talk about not all of them really can accommodate softball. And then also some of the questions came up in some of the meetings were, you know, parking, practice areas, uh, concessions. Maybe if you could touch on those. Sure. So um, as far as the ball fields in the area, um, James City County obviously has quite a number of fields. Um, but most of their fields are actually um, made for baseball, meaning they have grass in fields. Um, instead of the skin natural infields. Um, so as far as um, our, our main competitors and, and partners right there with James City County, most of those are made for baseball as opposed to softball. So um, we host uh, a softball program um, yearly, usually in the spring and fall. Um, and then we typically host the softball tournaments in conjunction with York County has a couple of softball fields and uh, York County as well. Um, so as far as the softball fields, we kind of 
uh, aim to be the hub in the area for, for softball. Um, I believe your, your other question was warm-up area, correct? Um, yes, yeah, so um, what we're going to do, uh, currently teams uh, warm up in the uh, grassy area, which will be field four. And so uh, field three was actually constructed at 250 feet. And so what we're going to do is put a fence at 200 feet. Um, so the teams will be able to warm up in that back 50 feet um, before they have to play on any of the other four fields. And then and we talked about parking can expand Park, to schools, yes. the school. Yep, yep. so um, for our larger tournaments, uh, what we would do is work with uh, WJCC schools um, so that we could use that James Blair parking lot as well for those larger tournaments um, that would bring in multiple teams. And then also, isn't the Kiwanis great because it has the, the children's playground and the tennis court? So family members that maybe aren't watching the whole game have other. Sure, sure, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, so um, you know, since we've renovated our playground, it's kind of been a destination playground as it is. And so um, just for, for families coming in from out of town, it's great for them to be able to um, send siblings and, and different family members over to the playground to allow them to watch the game and ha have the siblings have some fun as well um, at these tournaments. Yeah, thank you. So I don't have any questions. I think it's been well known. I've been an advocate for this since I joined city council a number of years ago. So really thankful to, for all of the work that staff did and for parks and recreation. And as Mr. Maslin said, for the collaboration with the, with the neighbors and making sure that a lot of things were reviewed, particularly since I think this first came to the, uh, was put on the CIP list probably 20 years ago or a little bit more, which could account for the change in the undergrowth and the trees from, from them to now. But I'd, I'd also like to, to thank the TDF Grant Review Committee for their recognition of the value of adding this uh, field to Kiwanis and how it can be a driver in our overnight visitation. It just shows, the, again, the value of, of having the Tourism Development Fund that it allows us to have money to proceed with these types of projects. So can't wait to see it, see it actually in use. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron, for the presentation and Tyler for all the clarification. Uh, recognizing that we are a locality competing for recreational tourism, I think this would be a, a wonderful opportunity to bring some more in, seeing that sometimes they can go elsewhere. And understanding that concerns of the community have been addressed, I have no questions as well. I'm just I'm very appreciative of the work of staffs on this. If there's no more questions or comments, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Thank you, Tyler. Um, if there's anybody in the audience that'd like to come forward and, and speak to this, uh, please come forward and put in here, sir. Yep. Just state your name and address for the record. Welcome, sir. And again, if you could just state your name and address for the record. First of all, I want to thank you for allowing us to speak to the council today. If you don't mind, I will read much of my commentary. Since at my age, I do not want to forget anything, but leave anything out, which sometimes happens. My name is Roger Ciccone, and I live at 189 Lewis Robert Lane. I chair the committee for Long Hill Woods as regards the construction of the fourth ball field at Kiwanis Park. As you are aware, it has been a long process to get to this point, with some challenges to address both for the Recreation Department and the residents of Long Hill Woods. There were questions by many as to the need for and the need to spend this kind of money on a fourth ball field. Some in our community were opposed to its construction. As for the planning of the field, we were not kept in the loop over the years as previously agreed upon. We only became aware of what might be happening through occasional articles in the paper. It became obvious to us that it was going to happen, so we decided to move forward in cooperation with the city and its rec department, as we had indicated we would do years ago. <clears throat> we received notice on August 20th 
with a complete site plan for us to review, along with a notice to meet as early as August 26th or as late as September 15th to review these plans with the city. I do not know how many of you are engineers and can read and decipher an eight and a half by 11 engineering document. But speaking for myself, it is not easy, and damn near impossible. Be that as it may, after several meetings with the Recreation Department, the Planning Commission, city representatives, and the consulting engineer, as well as Mr. Tribbett, it was decided that the plan as proposed was simply unacceptable. Too many trees to be removed and loss of a large part of the existing buffer zone, exposing the nearest residence, which happens to be mine, uh, to that loss of trees, as well as concern about the planned drainage system. So back to the drawing board, as they say. All this, all this is to bring us to this point and the revised site plan. Thanks to Tyler Cobb <clears throat> for presenting us with enlarged site plans, that site with a G, as well as marking the outer limits of development. Our committee members were able to meet with Tyler, the city and consulting engineers, along with Aaron Burke, to walk the area and review and discuss the new plan. We found it to be much more acceptable as it addressed both the tree removal and the drainage issues. It also offered additional buffer zone plantings. Our committee and our community really appreciate those involved in helping design a new plan. <clears throat> Not only did those involved listen to our concerns, but they heard what we were concerned about and responded to them. Does not always happen these days. For that, we say thanks. We look forward to continued involvement as this project moves forward. We feel the city should accept and move forward with fourth field. One last final request. I would like to apply for the softball concession behind the right field fence. <laughs> Lemonade stand, right? <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to come forward and speak? Welcome, sir. My name is uh, George Barnett. I live at 197 Lewis Robert Lane in our Long Hill Woods community. Uh, I too, I, I uh, do wish to thank our city officials for listening and responding to our Long Hill Woods community concerns regarding the uh, details of the, the development of the fourth field. Uh, the limits of disturbance have been revised, and we certainly, certainly thank those efforts put forth by our engineering crew to make those changes. And uh, also handling all the stormwater issues as well. So I'm in fully support of the proposed plan to, to move forward with this development. Thank you all for your efforts, and thank you for hearing the concerns from our community. Uh, I think we we look forward to seeing some uh, good uh, quality uh, events over there at Kiwanis Park. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Would anybody else? Yep. Yep. Please come on up. Hi, my name is Cynthia Baker, and I am the current president of the Long Hill Woods Association. You just heard from our past president. But I just want to specifically thank um, Tyler Cobb, Robbie Hutton, Carolyn Murphy, Aaron Small, Aaron Burke, and you too, Mr. Trevitt, for all you've done to help us get to this point. 
And of course, you too are Councilman Ted Maslin, who has been a great help. And I have to tell you, I think it was three times staff came out and met us at the site. And sometimes boots were required. It was so wet because after the rain. So we are really grateful. And I, for one, am really looking forward to the game. So let's play ball. Thank you. <laughs> But anybody else? Seeing none other, I'll close the public hearing and come back for any additional comments. The, well, the only comment I would make is just sort of evidence by the speakers here that it does show the value of collaboration. And, and Ted, I thank you for getting involved as a, as a member of that community too and, and to all of those that participated in answering the questions and concerns. So. Like you, let's play ball. Yeah. Well, it, it certainly is a culmination of a lot of years' efforts to, to bring a fourth ball field to, to Williamsburg. And as Councilwoman Ramsey pointed out, it's a product of the Tourism Development Fund uh, that we put together some years ago to, to build new tourism product uh, to support our local uh, tax base. And so this is kind of the first big project out of the gate. So uh, that's a good thing. Um, and I'm very pleased that the neighborhood is, is fully supportive of that. And I, I'm very uh, rewarded to hear that, that staff worked with you and, and did all the things that, that one would expect, you know, community uh, city staff to do. And so, and also thank you, Mr. Maslin, for stepping up over there in Long Hill Woods. So with that, I'll entertain a motion. So I move to approve the special use permit for the fourth field at Kiwanis Park. Second. Second. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Ms. Ramsey. Aye. Mayor Pons. Aye. Vice Mayor Dent. Aye. Mr. Maslin. Aye. Thank you. So that takes us now to item five, reports, um, monthly financial statement. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I'm going to have uh, Ms. Dameron talk a little bit about the COVID-19 projections and uh, where we stand on our, our deficit estimates. Welcome, Ms. Dameron. Good afternoon. Um, so looking at our October COVID update, um, our real estate collections came in about 47% ahead of, a, of our projection and 37% more than last year. So we have a positive variance to projection of 192,000. The personal property is about 56% above the projection. 13% behind below where we were last year, or I'm sorry, more than we were last year. And we have $101,000 positive variance um, compared to the projection. Lodging, however, is 38% less than projected at this point in time and 64% less than last year. So we have a $223,000 negative um, variance. Meals is at 17% 17 ahead of the projection, but 34% less than last year this time. And we have $196,000 um, variance, positive variance. Business and professional occupational licenses exceeded the projection by 31,000 and is about 71% um, more than last year. Sales tax for education is ahead of the projection by 73% and um, ahead of last year by 7%, so we have 103,000 positive variance. The other revenue section is under the projection by 260,000. And just to break that up a little bit for you, fees and charges account for about 97,000. And of that 97,000, 94,000 is the EMS recovery, just not as, as much demand during COVID. Rent accounts for 52,000, of which the uh, Prince George parking garage accounts for about 22,000 of that. And then fines, which consist of courts and um, parking fines, is, uh, accounts for 41,000. And overtime for public safety, accounts for about 37,000. So that overtime is related to uh, when our public uh, safety employees attend events. And um, so there have not, not been as many events demanding that. 
In total, our revenue is ahead of projection by 140,000, and our expenditures are under the budget projection at this point in time by 1.3 million. So we are ahead of the projection in total by about 1.4 million. And then looking to the sales tax fund, our sales tax is uh, coming in less than last year by about 25%. And in the tourism fund, the um, sales tax portion is 17% compared to less than last year. And lodging is 52% less than the previous year. And then in our utility fund, we continue to see a decline in consumption of water and sewer, and we're monitoring uh, the impact of that on the revenue. Continue to do that. I would like to give an update on our CARES Act spending. Of the $2,609,359 that we were awarded, the city has either expended or committed $2,460,330. And I'd like to just share with you over seven broad categories how that spending breaks down percentage-wise. So um, for per, uh, personnel that has been diverted, and that's just simply personnel that had other duties that were reassigned during COVID, uh, 3%. COVID testing amounts for 1% of the spending, housing support for 3%, improving our telework, um, 11%, public health services accounts for 19%, small business assistance accounts for 48%, and then other, uh, broad category of other, but the majority of that are 287,000 is what we, uh, committed to the schools, and that accounted for 15%. Um, staff would request that council allow us to report back in at the December meeting, and at that time, we would also request that council directs us to take any remaining funds to reimburse the city for public safety costs. And with that, I'll entertain questions. Vice Mayor. Mr. Amron, thank you. Um, it's, it's extremely helpful to have this COVID update uh, monthly. And while there's some, some reasons to be excited, there's some positive numbers in there, you have to keep in mind that this, was, this is based on a worst case scenario projection. And so as we move forward and we see that the numbers, uh, the number of COVID cases continue to increase, it's concerning as we move forward um, that we may face some other restrictions as we move into the winter if, if we listen to, to the facts on uh, what everyone's projecting for the increase. Fortunately, we haven't seen the, the large increase in COVID cases in this area, um, but the potential's there. Um, so while, again, while there's some, some things, to, some positive numbers in here, um, it's still a reason to be extremely cautious moving forward. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Just if I can, I'll jump in and, and point out, you know, when we put together the worst case assumptions uh, and presented those to council, which is what this is based on, we assume that by this point we'd be entering recovery and we're clearly not. Um, but we're benefiting from the fact that our worst case assumption has not been realized in almost all the categories. And one exception is lodging. You know, our assumption, we, we accounted for uh, collecting about 20% in the lodging category that we normally do. And as um, Barbara just said, it's, it's worse than that. Um, so that's offset by the fact that we're running ahead in these other categories. In addition, I would, I would say you're 100% correct in that while this shows you a net positive as a result of conservative spending on the part of staff, we do have some expenditures coming up in December that will help balance this out a little bit. Um, but also, as we think about that worst case projection being based on us entering recovery at this point, and we're not, we need to be very cautious about overspending, thinking that it's, it's balancing out, uh, because, you know, the worst may yet be to come. Mr. Maslin? Uh, two questions. Uh, we had talked earlier about having a mid-year adjustment in terms of the budget. Is, do we have any plans to true up the budget mid-year or not? Well, typically what we do is we see how the um, 
real estate and personal property collections are coming in, and and um, and then, and then we look back and, and update. By then, we have additional months to see how our meals are continuing, whether there are other restrictions. And so, yes, we always take a look or a snapshot at about that six month, and then um, Mr. Trivet and I will communicate and determine if there are any other measures um, that we need to take. Or that. Uh, second question. So uh, several weeks ago, we saw that your county reported out that they, I think it was about 35% increase in internet sales tax. Uh, were we able to isolate that in our reporting? Uh, I have some information that I'll be sending out shortly, but I, I believe we were looking at about 20% um, increase when we look at the internet sales. However, um, Ms. Irvy seems to think that that will be leveling out. We may level out to around 10%. But I will be sending out some data um, here shortly in the next couple of weeks that will speak to that um, a little better. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Director Damon, for your, your always detailed presentations. I wanted to ask about a recommendation um, you had for council in December. Should we have excess funds from the from that CARES Act allotment? Um, well. You? The recommendation would be that we reimburse for public safety, right. and I um, got excited about sharing those percentages, but the two numbers that I gave you on what we were awarded and what we were have expended or committed leaves about, at this point, 149000 available. Um, but CARES would allow us to reimburse the city for public safety cost, um, and that would be the recommendation. Um, again, uh, some of these could come in um, more, slightly more, or slightly or less than what we have in terms of what's been committed. And so having an update at the December meeting would be timely enough for us to make um, adjustments or how, however council directs. Uh, but think. the funds do have to be expended by the end of December or committed and then we have 90 days to make payment. Well, and on that note of funds needing to be uh, committed, let, let me recommend to any business that may be watching today, there's four days left to apply for the grant money, uh, which we allotted from, from last council's meeting. So if you're a lodging or a restaurant, you are applicable. The application is very easy, and with four days left, I'd certainly recommend anybody does um, apply, should they be interested. In December, when we look at the reimbursement for public safety, what are some of the uh, actions on a public safety standpoint that we would be reimbursing? Uh, we would be looking at salaries. Okay. Or overtime pay? Uh, not generally. necessarily overtime, no. no. So uh, basically what we're saying is what we'd like to do is come to the December meeting with the necessary action items for council to allow us to take whatever's left in the CARES Act balance and put it toward that purpose at the end of December. Uh, what that will do is make sure that we don't have anything left in the balance. Mm -hmm. It'll also, you know, one way to think about it is, and we're gonna give you an update in, under the city manager report um, on how the grant process is going, which plays into how much money we might have available at the end of the process. Um, what we will do by moving that money into the general fund and offsetting public safety expenses is it, it frees up the current money in the budget that's allocated to those purposes. And so then the city council will have much more flexibility in, in terms of timing and restriction as to what you might want to do with that. Now, obviously, the staff recommendation is going to be that you be cautious with it because once you've done that, it frees up money to help uh, cover the deficit that we're worried about occurring by the end of the fiscal year. Um, but it certainly will make it much easier to do some additional programs or, or fund some additional things once we have satisfied the CARES requirements, uh, if that makes sense. I see. I'll look forward to further discussion on that. Those are the questions I had. Thank you again. Thank you. I have no other questions and appreciate you coming forward. Anything else on the financial statement? I think that's it, Mayor. Monthly departmental operating reports? Okay. Yeah, so under the departmental operating reports, we wanted to ask Chief Eagle to come forward and, and give us an update on where we stand in terms of COVID-19, particularly in Williamsburg, but also in the region. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
Currently, the Virginia Department of Health is reporting 198,027 positive cases in Virginia with 3,758 deaths. In Williamsburg, our number is reporting at 244 total positive cases from the start um, until now with eight deaths and 14 hospitalizations. Currently, um, we, they're reporting approximately 25 positive cases that have reported over the past 14 days in Williamsburg. At present, um, Williamsburg has seen a small uptick over the seven day average. Um, we're at 12.5 per 100,000 population. That's a little higher than we have been being and it's a little higher than both James City County and York County at 6.9 per 100,000 and 10.5 per 100,000 respectfully. Um, William and Mary has done a fantastic job. They have a very robust testing process. Um, they're very um, strict with their policies, their um, congregation policies as well as mask wearing. Um, Currently, they've had 61 positive cases for the entire semester. 20 of those were cases that they caught with testing prior to them arriving back on campus. And currently, they only have, well, they say less than six positive cases currently as of today. Um, as you know, they will be, the large majority of the students will be um, leaving, or their semester will be ending right before Thanksgiving and they will be off until mid to late January. Um, our local hospitals, currently um, Riverside Doctors Hospital only has one confirmed case in the hospital there, and uh, that uh, patient is in a regular bed, not in an ICU unit. Sintera also only has one patient currently, um, also not in the ICU. Um, both of them report that their um, bed capacity is good. They don't have any concerns at all. Also, neither of them currently have any flu cases, which is good. Um, so currently, they don't have any um, capacity issues, and they keep an eye on that all the time, and, the, and right now, they're not concerned with it. Um, we're re reporting, um, Department of Health is reporting that a vaccine should be available to high priority recipients and frontline healthcare workers as soon as December with the vaccine available to anyone who may want one by as soon as April. Um, the vaccine that they're um, working on has an efficacy of around 90%, which is fantastic. Um, to put that in perspective, most of your flu vaccines are somewhere between 45 and 65% effective. So that's a great, um, that's a high enough percentage that they think it will really put a break in the numbers that we're seeing. So the big concern now would be people traveling during the holiday season and either bringing that here or taking something somewhere else. Um, so our message to everyone is to stay vigilant, um, continue to wash your hands, wear your masks, uh, maintain your six foot plus of distancing and be careful um, with your con congregating. Um, we are seeing some people um, not quite as uh, vigilant on their congregation um, practices as we saw earlier on in the event. Um, so are there any uh, questions that you may have with what we're seeing with COVID-19? Thank you, Chief. I, I just, uh, obviously all of those are important reminders and especially with the holidays coming up and it's even been on the national news that, that now that's one of the most common ways that it's spread is just family gatherings. Um, and they're cautioning against those with Thanksgiving coming up. Um, I sat in on a national conference call a couple weeks ago, and they mentioned there, I don't know if, if you've had any insight from VDH, um, that they said one of the problems with the flu coming on is because the symptoms are similar, it's going to be difficult to diagnose without a test, diagnosing COVID compared to the flu. Yeah, that's absolutely correct, and they're, they're reminding everybody to, to get your flu shots, too, to try to offset that and to prevent it the best that they can and keep, keep that spread down as much as possible. But it has very similar type of symptoms, and, uh, and it's possible to get them both. So um, just maintain that vigilance. The, the, the good thing is the precautions for 
uh, for the COVID-19 virus are the same precautions you would take for the flu virus. So that's, that's the good thing with that. All right, thank you. The, uh, following up on uh, the vice mayor's comment, I, yeah, I think that the big difference between the symptoms are gonna be the uh, sense of taste of smell and, and taste and smell, right? So maybe we can enlist some of our restaurants to help at the testing sites, right? <laughs> <laughs> With a slice of pizza or something. That sounds uh, good. The, uh, yeah, William and Mary, I think, definitely deserves a shout out for everything they're doing. And uh, can you talk about how, how many different tests that they're offering? That they're even testing the population to sort of make sure that the individual tests they've got are, are in sync. And uh, the other thing that I think is, is really good that they've uh, decided to cancel spring break and sort of reimagine it into extended weekends. And when you see the difference between what they're doing and what we saw on, after the uh, Notre Dame football game, you know, we really need to, to give them a shout out. They've done a phenomenal job for sure. Yeah. Oh, oh and the vaccine. Uh, so is this the vaccine that has to be super cool? And does that, when it's administered, does that sort of suggest it's going to be more centralized distributions? I do know that it has to be um, climate controlled. I'm not sure to what extent that is. I know that VDH has already started making arrangement for cold storage of that um, and we have had several conversations on um, on how um, mass distribution of that vaccine will look and using points of distribution that we've already put in place through our emergency management plan on getting uh, that out to the masses so um, those are all discussions that are currently in the planning stages with our um, VDH and emergency management partners. And I think one thing I haven't heard is uh, how long are they predicting it would take for it to be effective once you get the vaccine? I, I don't have an answer to that question. I think one of the things um, the chief has spoken as a fire chief would very definitively about uh, when we might see vaccine. And I just, we were having a conversation earlier today uh, with the mayor. We need to be very cautious about expectations in this regard because it's just, it's still too uncertain, um, particularly as we talk about distribution of the vaccine and, and when we might get first doses. Um, what the Department of Health has told us is that even the first round all of Hampton Roads, the entire region, might only receive 40,000 doses. Um, so if you think about everybody in Hampton Roads, that, that's not going to go very far. So while we may get some initial uh, vaccine in the region in, let's say, January, um, it's unlikely that there will be mass quantities available and, and a process in place for everybody that wants one to go and get it. It will likely go to those who need it most first. Um, so just measure expectations. Everybody, we're, we're paying attention to it, I think, is the message and uh, we're going to be ready to do whatever we're called upon to do in terms of distribution. Thank you. Chief Eagle, thank you. Um, and to your point about the symptoms of the flu being similar to COVID-19 and you wouldn't really know until you got a test, are you aware of how easy it is to, to still get a test for, for COVID? Because I had one in August and I didn't really have to you know, have specific symptoms, um, they allowed me just to go in and, and get one. Whereas I hear in some parts of, you know, the state, the country, that's not the case. Um, we haven't heard of any um, problems getting it. Right now there's, there's, of course, several different types of tests, the rapid test as opposed to the one that takes several days. Um, we have had some um, delay in getting results back with some of them because the labs have gotten backed up because of, of the, the volume of testing that has taken place. Um, we haven't had any problems. Um, of course, as we send our people to get tested, they, they get some priority being um, healthcare workers and first responders to, uh, to go right in, where some people, if they don't have any symptoms or anything, there has been some report that they have to have a doctor um, evaluate them first and then get the test, um, which could be all at the same time. Um, so there is some of that. Um, it depends on where you go and the type of test you're getting. There are some drug stores and others that are um, allowing testing um, as long as they have them. Um, so I think it depends on where you go and what type of test you're getting, but we have not seen any problem with anybody currently being able to get a test. 
And, and last but not least, um, I would also like to add a shout out to William and Mary and the strict protocols that they put in place, particularly as someone who lives in a high concentration of, of students in, in my neighborhood. Uh, I think there was definite concern about how their behavior would impact the residents in our community. And when we signed on to the Healthy Together community commitment, we were unsure of, of how things would, would work out through the semester. And uh, as they get ready to, to leave at the end of semester to break, I think we owe them a lot in this community for the diligence that, and the good example they've been to all of us. Yeah, certainly echo the sentiment of my council colleagues uh, to testing. I had a moment last week of seasonal allergies where I sneezed and thought, uh-oh, I better be safe, and, and, and went to Velocity Urgent Care and, and had no problem getting a test in no time. So, so thankfully, I think there are many institutions that, that still carry them and allow you to have those results quickly. Um, I, I also want to echo, as everyone has, um, a special shout out to William and Mary. We, we heard months ago from Sam Jones, the head of that task force, a gentleman who had announced his retirement and then came right back into the fold to lead uh, this effort of theirs to, to very, very adequately respond to a pandemic and I think they've done a fantastic job while in, in light of some other schools uh, it's been more difficult so that has been a, a great I think feather in our caps to have William and Mary taking this so seriously and I certainly appreciate you doing the same Chief Eagle. Thank you. Chief thank you for the numbers. Yeah. Thank you. Okay um, city manager report. One item on department reports. Yeah, I just wanted to drill down into one of the public safety reports. Uh, for those of you who are online, you just click the uh, reports and go to public safety, and then we go to number of vehicles utilizing the Prince George garage. And uh, two things that I think are notable in this report. Uh, the first one is that uh, according to the uh, dashboard, we are on target. Uh, we've actually exceeded uh, the monthly goal in uh, October um, quite well, which was good. And then the second thing is if you actually look at the chart uh, there, you actually see that the, the spike, the, 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 the time in all those years that we've uh, been reporting, the time that had the most vehicles was actually last December. So I, I think that's worth noting. Thank you. Thank you. City Manager report? Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we wanted to ask Michelle DeWitt to come up and give you an update on the status of the COVID-19 grant relief for um, lodging and restaurants. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of City Council. Um, great to be here today. I will say my phone has dinged three times since I've been here, which means it's telling me to go review another grant applicant. So as they come in, um, my phone dings. So these numbers were, were good an hour ago, but they're, they're probably up a couple more um, since then. We've re received a total of 76 applications, um, totaling $515,000. And if you break that out to what we were planning for, we were planning to receive about 49 lodging establishments, 27 have applied. So the delta there is um, 22. And we had, Estimated 100 restaurants would apply and 49 have applied, so the delta there is 51, minus the three dings I just got on my phone. Um, and to remind you, the total amount um, allocated was $1,012,500. And we've received requests for $515,000, as I've said, and so the delta, to trust my brain to do this, is $497,500, so 497,500, just shy of $500,000 remaining. Still three in Still the hopper and yes. four more days of applications. Exactly, so um, apply um, right before midnight um, at 11.51, Monday, November 16th is the deadline, and we're doing constant um, reaching out, all businesses received a postcard in the mail. They've all received an email telling them about this and we've also been making phone calls and the Economic Development Authority members have also been reaching out 
um, particularly we have members in, in those industries, so they've been reaching out as well. Good. Well, hopefully we'll, we'll see that number grow um, to get that money out there. Yeah, and the plan is, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm Michelle, in, in the process of reaching out, has there, been, has there been anything mentioned specific with the process that, that they find it difficult? Sure. So the vast majority um, are very thankful that the process is online and they find it very easy to do. You can even take a, a picture of your business license and upload it instead of having to scan it or have an electronic copy. I'll mention um, these may be outliers, but we've had a couple businesses who've said $5,000, $700, $7,500 just isn't worth my time to go through another grant application, which actually surprised us. Um, and then we've had a few people who were not comfortable with technology, and we knew that would happen. So what we did was we printed an application for them and snail mailed it or hand delivered it to them, helped them fill it out on the phone, and then they send it back to us and we enter it into the system. So everyone who has wanted to apply has been able to. So the point there is that they, they're still, with the, with the few days left, there's still an opportunity to reach out to you and your staff and, and get assistance to apply if, if they're having difficulties. Yes, yes definitely. Please do. Um, our number, it's on yeswilliamsburg.com. Um, there's a phone number and an email address. And I would assume, since we know who applied, we know who didn't apply. We do, yes. The efforts that you just talked about is a reach, outreach to those that haven't. Correct. So, good. Okay. Mr. Maslin, any questions? No. Well, I would just like to, to reiterate that at our EDA meeting on Tuesday, um, we went over the list and the members were asked to, to reach out to those that they knew. And there was discussion about why some did, some didn't, some had applied for grants previously, some I think their corporate management just again felt it wasn't worth it. And uh, so there are a lot of reasons, but I really appreciate all you and your staff are doing to, to get everyone covered if, if they want to be. Thank you. I have no questions. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate okay. the report. Anything else under city manager report, Andrew? Uh, the only thing I would say is that the balance that's left after the grant closes would be applied to the balance that Barbara spoke about in the CARES Act fund that we would ask you then to commit to public safety um, in December. And so we will have roughly from now until the end of December to decide if that's what we want to do or if there's other programs that maybe we need to create. Um, so there's still some time for some flexibility. Um, we just be, need to be cognizant of that December deadline um, so that we can have a plan in place. And I think taking action on the public safety reimbursement will guarantee that we do have that plan. To me, that seems, sounds like the, the smartest thing to do mm -hmm. so that we make sure that the, the funds do get spent according to the CARES Act. So. City Attorney report? Nothing today. So then that takes us to unfinished business, uh, consideration and adoption of resolution 20-22, establishing the 2021 city uh, Williamsburg legislative agenda. Mr. Trivet. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, so uh, we talked at, last month about the legislative agenda in the work session. I presented to you what I thought were the issues that were bubbling up from our regional partners and the other legislative agendas across the, the region. And over the last month, I've been looking as, as people brought their agendas forward, got comments from their boards or their, their commissions, and added things or took things away. And we're still pretty much right on track with what the region is supporting. Um, so a, a few years ago, we put this format together. It's a, it's a one-page format because, in my experience, that's what the legislators like to see. Um, and so it sort of boils it down into its simplest form. Uh, the front page talks about the priority issues, and on the priority issues, we have closed the gap, which is uh, directly related to finishing the widening project of I-64, particularly the gap section that's currently unfunded. Um, and if you've driven I-64 to Richmond, you know exactly the gap I'm talking about. Um, and probably if you've done it on a Saturday morning, you know why we need to widen it. Um, so hopefully we can still get some attention on that. Um, addressing connectivity under broadband, um, we've got an item there that's somewhat lengthy for a front page of a document. Let me see, Mark promised me I'd be able to do this, but I'm going to test. Yeah, look at that. Um, 
So under this one, this is sort of a lengthy item, but the nuts and bolts of this addressing connectivity is recognizing that there are really two barriers to service when it comes to broadband, affordability and the lack of infrastructure. In the city of Williamsburg, we really don't suffer from a lack of infrastructure, but we do have areas that suffer from affordability concerns, primarily because of a lack of competition. And the city has tried to address this time and time again unsuccessfully because you've got to have a market uh, in order to interest another company. And that's pretty difficult to do when you think about the size of our population. Um, so we, what we're doing with this item is encouraging the state to consider other ways to incentivize competition and address that affordability. Um, and so we're suggesting that they can take these two items that we have under broadband programs, expanding and equalizing the communications tax, which would free up a, a revenue source that could be dedicated to bolstering existing grant programs or adding new grant programs that could fund innovative approaches to providing broadband service in the community. And uh, before I talk about the last item under the priorities, I wanted to just pause for a minute and uh, let Mr. Barm give you an update on a broadband issue um, that directly relates to the GIO adoption later on the agenda. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of council. Uh, so as you know, broadband has been an issue for us in Williamsburg for quite some time. Uh, the GIO uh, piece that Drew has mentioned, we've been working on um, in, in, in more of a traditional uh, manner in terms of putting infrastructure in the ground and, and connectivity out. So um, we kind of reimagined that and, and decided that, that maybe wireless was the, the way to go for us. Uh, so in the, in the midst of reimagining what internet connectivity and wireless internet connectivity could look like for residents of Williamsburg, uh, the governor's office released $30 million of CARES Act funding, uh, which uh, we applied for. Uh, we have a, a, a pilot project that we presented to them to essentially provide free wireless internet access uh, to all residents of Highland Park for a six-month pilot project. During that time, we would uh, gather data, um, kind of figure out what works well, what doesn't, uh, and then see uh, if this could be a model moving forward for the city. Uh, we were told uh, early this, about 11 o'clock, right before lunch today, that the governor's office has approved our um, our request or our application in full. So uh, we will be getting started on that project very, very quickly as in weeks, because we have to spend, we have to have the service in place by the end of the year. So uh, that's an exciting project for us and something that we hope really addresses uh, the issues that, that are in the legislative agenda here that you see before you. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the GIO item on the agenda as well. Um, but did want to highlight a success there. And congratulations to IT and Mr. Barn particularly for putting together the grant program. Thank you very much, Mark. I think that's quite a significant achievement yeah. for our community. Yes. So appreciate your efforts in leading that. It's a big step forward. I, I know it, it seems like a small thing, but in terms of our vision for broadband in the city, this is a major step for us. So it's very exciting. Connecting us to the world. That's right. So the next item under priorities are, of course, always here and probably always will be here is local government revenues. There's a huge list of local government revenue concerns there for the state to consider. And essentially the message is, and as you can see, the legislative agenda marks items with these logos that where an item is repeated in another legislative agenda, a partner agency of ours. This is one that's shared by just about everybody. Um, the message is please don't do anything that reduces the revenue that comes to us funding all these these necessary services. So then on the back of the page, uh, we, we look at some of the other issues, good governance, uh, FOIA exemptions, economic development, transportation priorities. Um, I-64 is in our, our top priority list on the front page, so it's not here anymore. We do have an item on passenger rail, um, still an important part of our planning for visitation here in Williamsburg, particularly as we see the, the log jam clear in Northern Virginia for higher speed rail. Um, and certainly we want to make sure that the peninsula and Hampton Roads gets their share of that. And then state and local partnerships is where we put in some of the items that are important to our regional and local partners um, and advocate for that with the state. And then there's a, a disclaimer at the end that talks about all the agencies that we participate in as members of their boards and as such agree and adopt their agendas as well. Um, so the importance of that statement really is that during the legislative session, there is a whole host of bills that come up 
um, that we may not have anticipated. And so just because it's not on this list or on their list doesn't mean that the city won't take a position during the legislative session. Um, and so we frequently do go to Richmond and take a position in person. Um, and oftentimes, because we don't do that very often, our input is heavily considered. So um, we're excited to present the legislative agenda for adoption. Good. Well, thank you. You know, one of the strategies I think we deploy when we put together this, this uh, legislative agenda is to keep it kind of shorter and succinct. Uh, you know, I think oftentimes they can be too lengthy and, and when you talking to your legislators and going over it, you know, their eyes just kind of glaze over because it's just so much. And so I think we've here highlighted um, the top priorities. And so, Andrew, thank you for putting this together. Any questions, Mr. Vice Mayor? So, Trevor, when, could you just, uh, for, for those people watching, just it, if this is approved today, what's the next step moving forward? Sure. Um, so what we will do next is we will have a legislative briefing meeting with our legislators. We invite uh, Senator Mason, Senator Norman, and Delegate Mullen to come up and just have a conversation about the legislative agenda. The importance of that is really less about us talking about our priorities and more about us getting to hear from them what they expect to see in the session. As certainly they know better than we do what might be in the pipeline. But it also gives us an opportunity to advocate for these things, particularly the items that require funding. Um, there are some items that have come up since we talked about the legislative agenda that we probably want to mention during our um, legislative briefing. One example would be, um, and this is sort of in the weeds, um, VDOT's allowance for project funding. So we have grants that we've been approved for through VDOT, but because of COVID-19, the release of the funding is delayed. And so what we would ask them to consider is asking VDOT to allow us to proceed with the project and be reimbursed which typically is not allowed, um, which would allow us to go ahead with the project if the locality could afford it to proceed with the project that needs to be done. And then when the time is right, the state could release the funding and reimburse us for our expense. Um, so that's an example of something that we'd bring up at the legislative briefing. Once we've done that, then the uh, legislative session will begin in January and uh, we will follow the bills as they're introduced and mark anything that may apply to us, whether it's positive or negative, and if need be, take a position on it. And then the session should end in, I believe, March or February. And um, so throughout that period of time, we'll be monitoring what happens with various bills. And then at the conclusion of the session, we get a lengthy report from the attorney on the legislative items that made it through and were approved and the actions that the city needs to take in order to be in compliance with the new version of the state code. And then we start the whole process over. After a year. <laughs> year after year, that's right. Well, when, when I asked this question in a previous meeting and, and I think your response was was meaningful when I know in your previous position you were heavily involved in representing the city and in, in um, tracking these bills but being there to, to speak on behalf of the city and without that depth in the organization now um, your, your comment was if you're not there you're not there that's right and so I think that's important that we consider that moving forward that um, we find a way to, to stay involved in pushing these issues forward for the city yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit sad for me because it's a part of the job that I really enjoyed um, following the legislation through and, and being there and the nitty gritty of is it going to get approved or not approved and helping helping state agencies take a position when they needed us to. Um, and I think Williamsburg enjoys a certain reputation. Uh, that when we take a position, it's something of importance. And so we're usually not called upon unless it's really important that something be done or not done. Um, so yes, in my budget presentation, I think for two years in a row now, we've asked for some funding to hire somebody to take over that role for us. Um, and they would do a better job than even than I could do as, a, as an assistant city manager because they would be there all the time. Um, so we'll see that again in the upcoming budget, I have no doubt. Whether or not we can afford to budget it would be another question. Thank you. Uh, Basil? Two questions. Uh, so I like the icons you're putting up there in terms of our partners and, and where, they, uh, where they're supporting what, or we're supporting what they're doing. So we got a survey from uh, Barbara recently, the Business Council, 
you know, they're asking for input for their legislative agenda. And of course, they coordinate with the regional and state chamber of commerce. Um, is there any synergy that we've seen in terms of uh, overlapping what we're doing with, with their thoughts for the legislative agenda? I went through, um, I, I took the survey um, and I didn't see anything that directly related to something that we would put on our priority issues. That's not to say that we don't support all of the items that were on their list. Um, but one of the things that we do, and this is sort of a roundabout answer to your question, I guess, is at the very beginning of the process of putting together the agenda back at the draft stage, um, I pull information from all the legislative agendas that have been even put forward as a draft. And uh, Sandy helps me actually make calls, and, and this year Sarah in our office as well, to jurisdictions all over the region to try and get even before it's a draft sometimes, uh, what they were thinking so that we can have some synergy. We send emails to William & Mary, Thomas Nelson, uh, the Business Council, the Tourism Council, and that way they can send us anything that they think might be a really important issue. And this year we didn't get anything in advance, um, but I think it's just because, as I've said before, we actually start our process earlier than just about everybody else. Uh, just about everybody else is about a month behind us. Um, so it makes it a little bit hard for us to have things here. Um, but if you look at not the business council, I mean, it's such a specific use case that most of their items directly relate to business or economic development funding. Uh, but if you look at some of the other agencies, uh, particularly the ones noted here, but even the jurisdictions in Hampton Roads, just about everybody has a 64 widening item, a broadband funding item. They may not look exactly like ours do, um, but we're right in the vein of what just about everybody is asking for. Uh, the other question uh, was for Nicole, and she just walked out. But maybe you can answer. So with the great news from Mark, uh, are we going to want to do any edits to our script for the uh, state of the city? We've already, we've already done it. No, I mean, based, oh, is in that with the good news? Yeah, we've already done it. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, and the only thing that I would say, um, thank you first for putting this together. I agree it's nice that it's very succinct. Um, but as far as the business council survey, three things jumped out at me that we do have and, and also the chamber as far as priorities. One is the I-64 widening. I think everyone is all on board for that. And also um, one of the items for consideration was additional funding for education, which we have asked for, and also additional funding for, for tourism, particularly for areas such as ours. So it's nice to know we are all on the, the same page overall. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation, City Manager Trivet. I have no questions. Thank you. So would anybody like to make a motion to adopt the legislative agenda? So I will move that the City Council adopt Resolution 20-22 as drafted. Second. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Ms. Ramsey. Aye. Mayor Pons. Aye. Vice Mayor Den. Aye. Mr. Maslin. Aye. Thank you, everyone. So that takes, some do takes us to item B, consideration and adoption of the 2020-2021 uh, goals, initiative, and outcome. Mr. Trivet. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, so after last Monday, we went through the, the goals here and the initiatives and outcomes and made the changes that you all requested. I sent those to you. Um, we made some wording changes to the, um, particularly the item concerning, uh, let me skip to that one. Advisory board. The advisory board um, to recognize the racially diverse backgrounds and opinions. I think that was brought up by Mr. Rogers. Um, we also made some changes uh, that uh, Mr. Maslin had suggested under communications plan. Um, and we also made a, a significant change to um, no, we didn't make a change. That's right. There was no change to this item, but Mr. Rogers pointed out that this was, even though it's only one, it's significantly important. And we talked about it as a staff afterwards. Um, I, so I just, I wanted to take a minute just to talk about this again. So basically, 
over the last many years, the city has been following the Go Green, Virginia Go Green program, which the way to think about that program is it's basically a ladder of sustainability efforts that you slowly climb. The idea being that if, if you're starting out at the beginning of a sustainability effort and you've done nothing as a locality, you would be at the bottom rung. And then year over year as you implement programs, chain process, change processes, and do more to protect the environment, you slowly climb the ladder until you reach where we are, which is really at the pinnacle, the platinum level. Now last year they did not do the, the Virginia Go Green Awards process at VML like they have been doing for many years, um, but it wouldn't matter anyway because we've already reached the highest rung of that program. And so what Mr. Rogers asked us to do at the retreat was to find a new ladder to climb, right? So this ladder took us to here, we need the next ladder now that takes us to the next level. Um, and so that's what we're going to be looking for. And so we mentioned here the Virginia Environmental Excellence Program, and that's another program that we've been enrolled in for some time and already had great success with. Um, so we need to find something else, another ladder that really explains carbon neutrality and, and where do we go from here. I think Mr. Rogers mentioned documenting what our current carbon level is and then identifying a way to reduce that. I think those are great plans. Uh, you mentioned Albemarle County and the efforts up there. Um, certainly we'll look and see what they're doing. Um, so I don't want this to seem like even though there's only one item here that we're playing it lightly. It's not. that This is a big task for us to take on uh, to find a new program that works um, but also to start implementing that first level of whatever that ladder is. Um, so with that Mr. Mayor we present the GIOs for adoption um, but I will go back to broadband. So under this item, we have broadband and the 5G future. This is the item that directly addresses the, the grant award that we've just gotten from the governor's office. Um, and so just to expand on that a little bit, you know, over the last few years, as we've talked about broadband service, we have investigated the, the possibility of putting wires in the ground. And I will tell you that I, I said to Mark, wires are yesterday. <laughs> um, we need to be thinking wirelessly, um, primarily because it's just so expensive if you have to dig uh, to put wires in the ground. And so we looked at um, sort of the steps of evolution. We, we went from digging holes and putting wires in the ground to looking at an experimental technology called flat fiber, where the fiber actually runs on the road surface. And it reduced the cost by about a third of traditional fiber. So that seemed very exciting. They're testing that currently, I think, in Northern Virginia. Um, but then you just you immediately take the leap to well, why do we even really need wires because wireless connectivity speeds have reached what you can get with wires in the ground. And so we began conversations with Verizon about how could we do that in Williamsburg, knowing that absent some type of major effort, we would sort of be on the tail end of 5G deployment just because of the size of the market. Those conversations led us to improved wireless service in the city. I don't know, some people may have noticed, but there's been a significant improvement in Verizon coverage throughout the city, particularly some of those dead spots uh, where we asked them to tweak a few things. But it also led to a conversation about, is the future of broadband really going to be seen as a public utility? Um, and I don't mean that in the sense of it's owned by the public. I mean that in the sense of trash service where we, pro we provide a contractor who collects the trash every day. Um, I personally feel like connection to the internet is now as much a part of life as anything is. Um, and if you don't have it, you're really suffering from it. Um, so we put together the effort with Verizon to think about it from that perspective, and we've really challenged Verizon as a company to help us think about a citywide deployment of 5G access as a, as a utility. And so we're working in that direction, and the grant program that we've just gotten from the governor is a huge step in the right direction um, because it'll allow us to test the theory of deploying that on such a wide scale in the Highland Park neighborhood. So while Highland Park is going to get the immediate benefit of having the service available for the next six months, um, the whole city will benefit from their experience as we test the equipment and test the ability of Verizon to keep up with the demand. Um, so it's very exciting. Again, kudos to Mark and his team for putting together the grant application, and uh, we're anxious to get started. 
I know that uh, we're going to be putting out a press release shortly concerning the award and what it means in terms of the pilot program. As Mark said, we're under a tight timeline because it's CARES Act money that the state has given us. They have the same spending requirements that we do. It has to be spent by the end of December. Um, so we're going to be moving really quickly with Verizon and another provider to put the necessary infrastructure in place, draft the policy documents, and start enrolling people in the program. Um, so I just want to make a note that if people are watching at home today, I'm thinking optimistically, um, and they want to get enrolled, we're not ready yet. Right? So there'll be more information coming out soon about how to get enrolled and what the speeds will be and, and how to trust the connectivity um, and what it means in terms of that six month window because that's all the grant funding that we have. Um, and then we'll have to make the decision about what to do at the end of the six months. Um, but again, very exciting opportunity to advance this project. So before you adopt the GIOs, we've already started. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. And, and you know, um, I think I said it Monday, and every time we talk about the GIOs, you know, staff, you, Andrew, did a great job in facilitating the conversation amongst council, but more importantly, amongst the community with the National Survey, uh, Citizen Survey, uh, all the efforts that, that we put forward to, ha to have that open communication with, with the community, I think, has gone a long way to establishing what we see here today. And, you know, to your point about the, the broadband, um, you're absolutely right uh, on, on several levels. Wireless technology, I mean, wires are yesterday. Obviously, there's some things we probably have to work out and make sure it's dependable and, and those types of things. But when you think about the internet, it's it's education, it's commerce, it's healthcare. I saw somebody, a commercial the other day, somebody using their Bluetooth to the phone to a diabetic reading machine that they have that went to the doctor and so, you know, cuts down on transportation and so, I mean, it is a way of life, and, and so I think if we can move forward in that effort to providing that as a form of utility to whatever that means at whatever speeds to be determined is the right direction for us to go. So along with the other goals and initiatives that we have here, I think we're, we've set a good, good course for the next two years and certainly lots to try to accomplish. Mr. Vice Mayor? Yeah, and just to reiterate what, the, what all of us said on Monday is thanks to you and the staff for all of the work that was put into the GIOs. And, and again, I've been on the other side, so I know how much work is involved. And, and again, this year, you know, <clears throat> compiling all of those comments from the community um, and, and having some concise uh, topics for city council to discuss at the retreat made it a much smoother process. And I think we were able to uh, achieve, you know, agreement on these GIOs rather quickly um, based on a lot of the background work that was done. So um, I think we have a, a great list of GIOs moving forward and just want to say thanks for all the hard work. I agree with the previous comments. Thank you. Um, I do also. I do have a question about the broadband pilot program. You mentioned uh, the deadline with December and CARES funding. Do the those who are going to be enrolled in the program have to sign up by the end of December as well? That is exactly the kind of question that we don't yet have the answer to. Um, but yes, I think is the answer. They will have to, we will have to have the money of, that, that has been awarded expended on the same timeline as our money. So I think what Barbara said is um, you have to have it committed by the end of December and then there's 90 more days to actually make the payment. Um, we're in luck that we had already started negotiating this pilot program with Verizon and their partner uh, in advance of applying for the grant. Um, when the grant was announced, I immediately sent it to Mark and said, hey, this might be exactly what we were hoping would happen. And as luck turned out, it was. So we're sort of ahead a little bit. I think if we were just starting, there would be no way we could get this done in the timeline. Um, so we were very fortunate that it just all worked out perfectly. In your conversations with Verizon, have you learned of other communities that are doing this, or is this something we're very forward thinking in? They said they've, they've been approached by other communities, and they never told us which ones, um, but I will tell you that the provider of the hardware that we're working with, Verizon Wireless is going to be the connectivity side of this. The hardware provider um, is very excited because they, don't, they haven't seen anything like this 
from their perspective, projects such as this, where communities are actually doing something like this. So from their perspective, they're, they've got all kinds of ideas of how we could uh, build this out moving forward. The evolution of this project um, has been sort of exciting because it started out just as a conversation that we were having um, around town mm -hmm. um, with some of our strategic partners, Colonial Williamsburg, William and Mary, talking about is this possible and, and if it were possible, would you be able to take advantage of it? And so we just kept sort of nudging it along. And we found ourselves uh, meeting with Verizon, sort of local representatives, including our governmental rep, and we uh, talking about broadband issues um, or cell phone coverage issues. And at the tail end of the meeting, I said, all right, I wanna throw something else on the table that, that you're not prepared for. And we pitched the idea of the public utility concept and them being a contractor to provide the service to the whole city. And they were quite surprised. And so then the next step was we had another meeting with Verizon where they brought in a VP um, of North American operations. And at that meeting, they told us that they had not had anybody requested at that point. So I think other localities are starting to think this way. Um, certainly COVID-19, I think, has inspired a lot of that. Um, but we were, I think, at the forefront of those requests. And uh, I think, I mean, we, I just can't tell you how excited we are that we're gonna be able to test the theory. Well, and I think this is one example of the excitement I see with the GIOs for these next two years, as I mentioned at the EDA meeting, there's so many of them that have synergy with each other and a much more holistic approach that I think will bode the city well. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Rogers. Uh, I too am, am just thrilled for this GIO <coughs> set. I think the, the announcement today, even having an idea um, like that for a community of our size is phenomenal. Uh, I mean, this is this is some Silicon Valley stuff right here, which isn't to say we're getting high rises anytime soon, but but we it's are. just something that <laughs> <laughs> well, n n nothing past five stories maybe, um, but but is 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 really commitment for us, and and, and I want to highlight um, the fact that with this pilot program, um, we as a city have decided to use that for the Highland Park community. Uh, I wasn't a part of the the decision to choose them. I don't think members of council were, which I actually think speaks really well to the character of our city and of our city staff to decide that Highland Park will be the, the area and the neighborhood that we are deciding to uplift with this pilot project because Highland Park, HP as I like to call it, um, is also the area that's been over the past many decades created um, almost unplanned from, from efforts to push people away from the Camp Perry area and its redevelopment, even some uh, efforts decades and decades ago in Williamsburg out of the Triangle Block area. So this community has, has been created and is one of our few that is a majority minority community and through now generations of truthful storytelling have recognized that their uh, neighborhood, their neighbors were, were kind of pushed to where they are. And I think that has made people feel in some ways like, you know, it, it's, it's not really, uh, um, it's not exactly an uplifting history. So I think this is a, a really phenomenal effort and, and I credit city staff for having the idea to now uplift this community and recognizing it to be the one to have this pilot project go, go into it. I'm thrilled for it. I thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, um, there's no other questions or comments. Is there a motion to adopt the GIOs? Well, I will move that uh, City Council adopt the 2020 21, 2021 GIOs. Second. Thank you. Ms. Mr. Rogers? Aye. Ms. Ramsey? Aye. Mayor Pons? Aye. Vice Mayor Dent? Aye. Mr. Maslin? Aye. That takes us to new business. Uh, first, item A uh, consideration and approval of an extension of the term of Economic Development Authority Discretionary Incentive Performance Agreement. Huh. Mouthful. <laughs> Michelle, Mr. DeWitt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Sorry, I left you hanging, Michelle. That's okay. Before we get started, I wanted to take a 
step back and just celebrate where we've been with this program. We um, initiated this program in 2017, and this slide should talk about it. Yes, in 2017, we initiated this program in May, um, got our first performance agreement under contract. And the way this works is it's an incentive program to help um, a new business or an expanding business in the city meet an identified gap that will make their business better or enable their business to come to the city. So an example would be Mellow Mushroom. Um, when they came, their project and their, their financial outlook did not allow them to do one of the outdoor patios. So the EDA and city council stepped in with this incentive, and the way it works is as the business pays taxes, uh, we return, we share them with the, the business. Part of them goes back to the business to help them pay for a certain element of their project. So the total taxes collected since we started this program has been over a million dollars. The incentives paid to businesses have been $369,000, and the net new taxes to the city is $700,000. Another thing to point out is that um, three or four, let me look at my sheet, three of our businesses have already completed their incentive um, packages, and they did so early. They did so well in the city, and we would argue it's because of that extra enhancement we were able to to bring with this incentive that they finished their paying um, back the performance agreement um, up to two years early. So that was really exciting to see that happen. Today I'm here to bring you down into the weeds a little bit though. Because of COVID-19, the EDA chose to extend all these performance agreements by one year because they are based on revenue that the businesses bring in. And with COVID-19, revenue is, is uncertain. This will not change the dollar amount of anything, but it just allows the businesses an extra 12 months to um, perform. So you'll see here that the EDA extended one, two, three, four, five of these, but the sixth one is over $100,000, which requires city council authorization, authorization to extend for a year. I'm happy to answer any questions. Vice Mayor. Yeah, no questions. I, I just think with the success of this program, and, and as you mentioned, there's many of them have uh, met their obligation early, uh, and with the impact of COVID, it's I think it's pretty straightforward that we um, we grant the extension. I just wanted to commend you on your foresight in terms of encouraging all these restaurants to expand the, the outdoor dining possibilities. <laughs> yes. Yes, it wasn't that interesting that that was a trend that was coming along that has been very, very important during this pandemic. And I, and I think on into the future, even when we're past this pandemic. I have no, no questions, just to comment that, um, say the proof is in the pudding as, as far as the value of having these in incentives available. I too have no questions, thank you. Yeah, uh, no questions. And you know, I think there's, there's no harm in us extending this a year. There's no cost to the city. Um, and if it, it allows the business, you know, the additional 12 months to achieve the goal, I think it's in our best interest to afford them that time, so. I, I move to authorize the EDA to extend the term of the August 13, 2018 discretionary incentive performance agreement with Precarious Beer Hall for one year from December 1, 2024 to December 1, 2025. Second. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Ms. Ramsey. Aye. Mayor Pons. Aye. Vice Mayor Dent. Aye. Mr. Maslin. Aye. Takes us to uh, agenda B, uh, item B, consideration and direction to staff regarding holiday parking rates at the Prince George uh, Street parking garage. Mr. Trivet. Yes, so uh, at the last city council meeting there, um, the city council took up the idea of holiday parking rates and asked us to bring back an item for consideration at this meeting. Um, so we provided you with a little bit of the information that we were asked for. Um, we were asked to provide some sales tax information. We did ask for that from the state for the year of 2017 so that we could compare it to the years that we had holiday parking rates. We haven't received that from the state yet. Um, but we did provide to you in the packet the uh, parking 
the number of cars that parked in the garage for the, the time frame, the, the most recent time frames, um, showed you some variances from year to year during those months, and also the revenues generated by the garage. Um, so hopefully, Mr. Mayor, you have the information you need. We're happy to answer any questions that we can. Quick question. When we talk about some of the other grants that we've provided to businesses, those funds came from uh, CARES Act funds. That's it's right. That wasn't a direct cost from the city. No. Question I had. Vice Mayor, any questions? Um, just so we, one thing is there's, uh, at least in my, if maybe you can clear it up for me, and I know I've had a lot of conversations with Councilman Maslin, but it, it's hard to have any direct correlation that the, the two hour parking um, either increased the, the number of vehicles or increased the business to the area is that yeah I mean I think it, it is very hard to make that correlation just because there's so many unknowns that can impact visitation to downtown um, even parking in the garage is impacted by the weather by the number of events that may be occurring um, you know it's just I think it's hard to say without some type of, of um, stipulation that the holiday rates drive an increase in visitation. And, and to your point on, on the nice weather with some of the nice weekends that we've had, it certainly doesn't appear that the parking has, the cost of parking has been a deterrent for the, I've been by the garage, been in the downtown area, that it's been a deterrent uh, for people to visit the downtown area. I think if it's a place they wanna go, the, the, the parking is just, they pay for that convenience. Um, and the other thing is, is as we've talked about in, in several cases today with the finances, one of the biggest concerns for me is, as you mentioned previously, we're not, we all thought we would be in the recovery phase of COVID and what other impacts are we gonna have on our revenue? Um, while, while this may not seem like a significant amount of money to some folks, as we continue to move forward and if we see more restrictions and we start to see it impact our finances more, um, it does become significant to me. Um, so, um, I, d I don't know that, that uh, there's, there's enough data there for me to support it, but I'm certainly willing to listen to uh, other council members. Mr. Maslin? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think we can guarantee that the great weather that we've been having, that's sort of driving a lot of the visitation at Merchant Square is going to continue into December. Um, we did get... Uh, some communication from the Merchant Square Association recently. Um, a couple of the, the points that they brought up is uh, we want to thank you so much for the support you have provided to our small businesses during the pandemic. The various grants, outdoor seating, and sharing of critical information by the EDA has been invaluable to each of our businesses. We have been so appreciative that the city has provided two free hours of parking during the month of December for the last several years. The two hours of free parking during holiday season has and will encourage people to come downtown and spend extra time and money shopping and eating. Obviously, it is even more crucial this year. During the pandemic, our research indicates that a higher percentage of visitors to Merchant Square are locals and regional visitors. In order to compete with Newtown and other local shopping centers, it's imperative that we invite people downtown and do all we can to showcase our fantastic and one-of-a-kind holiday experience. As merchants, it is vitally important to end 2020 on a positive note and to all work together to achieve this goal. So what are the benefits of offering this holiday parking promotion? Uh, as discussed, it allows us to give our merchants as much help as possible to recover from the COVID sales dip. By providing more free parking in Merchant Square, we help these merchants compete you know, with all the other shopping centers who have free parking now. Um, also, Colonial Williamsburg has offered to match our two-hour free parking promotion at their two pay lots, uh, P2, which is the new, improve, new and improved parking lot behind Barnes & Noble, and piece the P6 lot. In the current budget, 
staff allocated $35,000 to this promotion. We see that the difference between December 2017 revenue and December 2019 revenue was actually $21,700, which suggests that we will not need the entire $35,000. Uh, looking back uh, on several comments from last year's November City Council discussion, uh, we asked staff to indicate uh, the upcoming increase in vehicles for December 2019. Uh, and from the staff report, we see that there were 3,379 more vehicles recorded in December 2019 versus December 2017. Uh, when in December 2017, we did not have the free parking. Uh, that's a 24% increase. Uh, staff had also indicated that they would be able to compare December sales data for the Merchant Square businesses by March of 2020. Uh, unfortunately, we are still waiting for this info from the state. Um, I did hear from one of the uh, merchants that looking at their own records, they, they did see a 10% increase uh, those two months from uh, December 2017 to December 2019. And if, if we still can't get information from the state, we might want to be talking to individual uh, retailers and, and restaurants. Uh, the third thing is staff agreed to incorporate the December free parking into the budget for this year, and this was accomplished by reducing the revenue forecast in December by $35,000. And we, we noticed in the department reports that we are actually on track to meet budget uh, with the parking structure this year. Um, as, so as we have seen, the actual reduction between 2019 and December 2017 was only $21,700. So that leaves a, a COVID impact buffer of $13,300 for December. Uh, another comment we had last year was we wanted the merchants to publicize this promotion. And uh, they are willing and anxious to do that. In fact, uh, they wanted to do that several weeks ago in terms of starting that with their advertising campaign. Um, there was also a suggestion that we use a voucher system for people who spend money with our merchants. Staff had forecasted that this year such a system could be possible um, because uh, there were some problems the previous year with multiple uh, owners in, in the company that we're using. Uh, Drew, do you want to talk to that? Is that still a possibility? Yeah, I think it, I think it is a possibility. Um, it, it may be a little bit of a challenge for us to navigate and um, particularly, I mean, <laughs> The, the challenge is that our system in the garage right now is based on license plates and that we did that for convenience so that people, particularly the, the users here in the community, could drive in and drive out without the hassle of using the pay station or even the online app. Um, the difficulty is that doing some type of uh, voucher system or validation program with the restaurants requires them to know the license plate that's involved so that we can credit the right account. Um, not impossible to overcome that, but that would be a little bit of an annoyance. It's not like a lot of systems where you have a card that you have to stop and put in a machine, which we all agreed we didn't want to do, um, and then it just gets validated there by the restaurant. So it, it is a little bit more of a, a cumbersome approach, but I think Passport allows us to do that. That's our provider on the web app. Our pay station provider allows us to do that. The only trouble will be overcoming the license plate issue. But I think that the short answer is yes, we should be able to, to do that. Uh, jumping ahead to our current COVID funding options, uh, Drew, would the CARES Act's uh, funding be able to fund us reimbursing merchants who would take advantage of such a voucher system, do you think? So I, I think we'd have to be very careful about how we structured that. Um, the CARES Act money does not allow us to do revenue replacement. And so we wouldn't want to do anything that uh, an auditor might see at a later date as us replacing revenue lost in the garage. Um, and so they, they could see a voucher program as being just that. Um, what we would probably want to do is, is design some type of a grant program that had broader application that could be used for that purpose by the business. Um, so I, I think we could get there. It may not be a direct route. So, so thanks. Uh, so in, in conclusion, uh, we should determine whether we want to assist our Merchant Square 
area restaurants and retailers uh, with a similar or improved uh, program this year. Uh, remember, we're currently rolling out a $1 million worth of funding to help our restaurants and our hotels. Uh, unfortunately, that does nothing to help our retailers uh, who are also hurting. Uh, that's all I had. Ms. Ramsey? Thank you. Um, I guess I look at this a little different way in that I don't view free parking or a savings of $2 for parking in the garage as the reason that I would come to downtown Williamsburg to, sh to shop, to dine, to walk around. For me, it's all about the experience. And I think that, um, again, not to use one of my favorite sayings, the proof is in the pudding, but I think that if you look at the past weekend, where, yes, we had great weather, but we also had a farmer's market on Saturday. We had a lot of people downtown. We had second Sunday on Sunday. And so there were activities to bring people and to reward them for coming to Williamsburg. And as I look forward to December, I'm excited in a way that Grand Illumination is going to be spread out over three weekends because that will provide the opportunity for locals and for people coming out of the area and perhaps to spend the night to enjoy the downtown Williamsburg Christmas experience. We're now going to have Grand Illumination on three Sundays. There's going to be a holiday market set up in the P6 parking lot. There's going to be um, maybe a farmer's market the, the first Saturday at least in, in the um, in December, the skating rink is going to be open. So to me, those are the things that draw people to, to Williamsburg as opposed to saving $2 or $4 on parking, which I'm not a coffee drinker, but I think is about the cost of, of a cup of coffee. And um, I also think that um, instead of giving, and we've also seen that Colonial Williamsburg having shifted their, what is it, P2 parking lot from free to, to pay, and as has been pointed out, at a higher cost than what the garage is, that they haven't suffered. That uh, the parking lot was pretty well full on Saturday and Sunday because people, particularly those coming in from out of Williamsburg, expect to, to pay for parking. They expect to pay for convenience and they come here for the experience and they're not going to get that same experience in Newtown and they're not going to get it if they go you know to another shopping center we're very special and I would rather see us if we're going to um, to do anything to try and do what we can to enhance that experience or if we wanted to to look at a way that we might make a an offering to to a group to to help those in need, there was an article in the paper recently about the House of Mercy as having a holiday market to have children's gifts that are donated or purchased by donations to the House of Mercy. And I can see perhaps taking some of the, the revenue from, from parking in December and maybe working with Colonial Williamsburg for a program um, to have our visitors here help support uh, a cumulative effort for a greater need, um, which would, would be um, my thoughts on it. Thank you. I think um, in making a, a budgetary decision like this, important to look at um, in any numbers that are available. The highest I saw offered to us was that it could be a loss of $40,000 to decide to go free um, in, our, in our parking garage. And why? I recognize the idea that providing free parking, just as the word free is so um, alluring to people, sounds like it would be greatly to the benefit of the community, to our retailers. I think there are other ways we can accomplish this one, one mentioned by Councilwoman Ramsey. And I agree with the idea uh, that when people come to Williamsburg for their vacation, you know, they're, they're not going to, no offense to our our uh, neighbors at James City County go to Newtown and then call it a day. Uh, they're going to downtown Williamsburg in which the parking at our very fair cost of $1 an hour, I doubt would, 
would preclude them from staying in the area. So as I look at it, I, I think it sounds good to give free parking, but in realizing that that is still a shortfall on the city's behalf, which could be put towards something else, also to the benefit of the community, I don't think that the costs outweigh the benefit. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> well, I think I, I agree with the bulk of my, my colleagues on council. Um, and I certainly uh, don't agree with Mr. Maslin's assertion that we haven't done anything to, to help our merchants while we've helped our restaurants and our uh, hotels. Um, we did have a BPOL grant program for businesses of all kinds in the city. But we've also made significant investment in the downtown area with adding the tables on Duke of Gloucester Street, which has been a huge huge attraction and brought many many people to the area um, that that walk into the merchants that may not have otherwise been there so um, so I, I don't know that it's fair to say that we're not doing enough for our businesses um, I say that recognizing that our businesses are still suffering and we want to do all that we can and I think we're doing that and I think councilwoman Ramsey was apt to point out all of the different things that we're doing I think Colonel Williamsburg and his Three weekends of, of grand illumination is going to be a, a big attraction um, so we're putting a lot of effort into tr attracting visitors to the downtown area um, so and then to Mr. councilman rogers point i think the, the loss of revenue which is different than spending cares act money in grants in face of as vice mayor uh, dent says in this COVID economy it's just not prudent um, this would be a true cost loss of revenue to the city um, and I just don't know that we're in a position to do that today so but those are my thoughts so if I don't hear a motion or any other thoughts we'll, we'll move on okay so that takes us to item C consideration approval of fire station one PPAE process and selection of proposers uh, to move forward a uh, move to detailed design phase yes thank you mayor we'll ask uh, chief eagle to come up and uh, uh, introduce this item good afternoon again good afternoon um as you know um the city uh put out an rfp back in august for replacement of our fire station number one um through that rfp we received seven proposals um and at that time, we received all those proposals. We had an internal staff committee along with our construction uh, manager consultants who went through each of those proposals um, for quality and responsiveness and um, how, it, how it worked for the department, how it met the, the statements of council. And we ranked those um, and have decided to come back to ask um, for your approval to move forward with four of those firms to move into the detailed phase of the PPEA process. So with that, um, the committee uh, selected Centennial, David Nice Builders, Henderson, and PG Harris. Um, should you choose to move forward with those four firms at this time, um, staff will go to each one of those and ask for a more detailed uh, proposal. Um, ask questions of each to make sure we we have everything pinpointed and kind of narrow down more about what what each proposal offers get some clarifications on some questions and so forth and uh, we will bring them back in with a more detailed phase in December um, at that point council will have a, an opportunity to interview each of the four um, proposers if that's what we decide to move forward with and um, then there will be an opportunity for public input on those four proposals. Um, and then from that, our hope, if everything moves um, on schedule, if, it is, if this is what y'all would like to do, then we will um, narrow that down to one of those four particular firms after the interviews in January, and then start negotiating for an interim agreement um, shortly thereafter. So our recommendation today is to move on with the PPA process and select Centennial, David Nice Builders, Henderson, and PG Harris 
to uh, move forward and participate in the detailed design phase of the PPEA process. Any questions? Uh, hey, could you just re repeat the uh, public process so people are looking forward to in, in December where they can weigh in? Yeah, so um, part of the PPEA process is after the interviews, after each of the however many we decide to go forward today, staff recommends four companies. Um, they will come back in December um, with conceptual drawings, with more detailed details on exactly what they're proposing. Um, Council will get an opportunity to interview each at that point, and then those drawings, those renderings will be um, available for public input from mid-December through sometime in January. Um, it will probably be a virtual input, um, public input process, very similar to how we did with our GIOs um, recently. Um, that way, council will be able to get in, uh, get. Um, comments from the public. Um, we will have a, um, a way for the ARB to comment, for the general public to comment, um, for other stakeholders in the community, whether it be um, members of the, the department or volunteer department or um, other committees um, or boards in the city, um, to get comments from as many people as we can so that you all can make the best decision moving forward um, with narrowing those four down to one. And then in January, our hope is to come back um, after all those comments are received, after you've heard the, um, the presentations from each of the firms, after you've had an opportunity to ask all the questions that you want from each of those four firms to make a decision on one particular firm. Um, and then after we select that one firm, the city will be able to negotiate with them um, to enter into an uh, interim agreement so that we can start with construction documents and move forward uh, with the process. Thanks, Chief. I have no questions. Thank you. Neither do I. Thank you, Chief Eagle. No questions. Um, so just a general comment. You know, I've enjoyed seeing all seven of the respondents. Um, I think there was a wide range of visual, you know, aesthetics, uh, designs proposed, um, but I think we've narrowed it down to these four, and I would agree that these four are the, are the, the ones that I would choose to go forward with and, and look forward to them participating um, with us in this process. So, if anybody else has any comments? I'll take a motion. So, I move that uh, City Council proceed with the PP. EA process um, with the selection of Centennial, David Nice Builders, Henderson Inc., and P.G. Harris invited to participate in the detailed design phase. Second. Mr. Rogers? Aye. Ms. Ramsey? Aye. Mayor Pons? Aye. Vice Mayor Dent? Aye. Mr. Maslin? Aye. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. That takes us to open forum, which is an opportunity for anybody in the audience who would like to come forward and, and share your thoughts with the council. Please come forward and state your name. Welcome. Good afternoon, um, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council members. My name is Beth Hall. And I live at 3440 Hunters Ridge. I'm here representing the WJCC Coalition of Community Justice. We're a coalition of concerned community groups and individuals working for equity in our legal justice system. Our first priority is to, to the establishment of an independent civil civilian oversight board for the police department that has subpoena power, independent investigators, and make disciplinary recommendations to the police chief based on its investigations of complaints. We have had conversations with both police chiefs and are hoping to speak with council members. We look forward to meeting with you. That's all. Would anybody else like to come forward? Seeing none, I'll close the open forum. Um, I believe we have an item for closed session, or several. I move to go into closed session pursuant to section 2.2-3711 per subparagraph 7 regarding two legal matters, 
for the purpose of consultation with legal counsel pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation and open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body regarding recently filed litigation and two personnel matters per subparagraph one per pertaining to the evaluations of the city manager and the city attorney. Second. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Ms. Ramsey. Aye. Mayor Pons. Aye. Vice Mayor Dent. Aye. Mr. Maslin. Aye. Okay. We are in closed session.